Because Kate has different levels of friend. She's got <laughs> friend, and she's got lovely friend. Back to the present day, as we travel. No, yeah, it is. As we travel back to the future. So we're gonna... This house had a mystery fit for Sherlock Holmes. Please. Sorry to say goodbye to you after this wonderful walk, but my legs have had it. You can forget about your advent nonsense, everyone. 50, I've got 50. It was worth... Sherlock Holmes and the case of the missing sideburn. Oh, gosh. Just think about the amount of time this must have taken her. And this is someone who, let me tell you, yeah. she, I You're don't know. You're not telling me that by know. the time she got to 30, she was thinking stupid birthdays, <laughs> stupid friends. Amazing. Can I tell you my favorite bit? The end. Everybody to a brand new Bakery Bears video show. Oh yes, and this time we're featuring another Walk in the Dales. Yes. Now, it's fair to say that on the last two walks, two walks ago we were of course in, we were Staithes in the Moors, which was amazing. Oh, that was, that was, was the, the last walk. seaside one. That was the last walk. And then the one before that was Greeter Valley in the classical Yorkshire Dales. And I think it's fair to say, definitely those are my two favourite walks that we've ever done. They were tremendous. And, you know, you, you could think, oh, you know, we've had two great walks. Just do some easy ones for the rest of the series. But no, I thought, why don't we try and raise the stakes? And on this walk that we're gonna to do today, later on in the show, there's more uphill and down dale, <laughs> literally, than in any walk I've ever done. Now, would you believe that last time we saw you, Kay launched a jelly roll book? <gasps> well, of course you'd believe it, because you saw it. Yes. And it's been wonderful to see people well, it's been amazing. I know you felt really humbled, haven't you? <sighs> it's blown me away, to Seeing be honest. Seeing people jelly rolling all over yeah, the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all over Instagram, I keep getting tagged. If you want to tag it on Insta Instagram, actually, if you are working on a jelly roll, just hashtag jelly roll blanket. People seem to have adopted that. Just so many beautiful blankets on the go. And just your enthusiasm over it has just been amazing. Because I honestly had no idea... I, I thought, you know... Well, you just approached it in the same way. Yeah, you approach I approach all your everything. Relations. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's to be fair, just, though, as we, spoke about, overwhelming. as we spoke about last time, it was a slightly longer... Yeah, development. Development. <laughs> it was, absolutely. Yeah. So but I suppose... Still, I, still, I still never know. You still never know, really. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, I... I, I it's an interesting one, isn't it? But because you know, sometimes people say, "But this isn't the case," because you just never know with certain patterns. No, certain ones you don't. Just, you don't, and, and not just you. Any, no, any patterns. No, any patterns. Yeah. You certain know, ones just go crazy that you do, would never expect. Do. Yeah, yeah. And then absolutely. other ones, but it's sort of nice in a way because you work so hard on the development of the jelly roll I concept. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. And so it's just that just makes it. You know, you just think, oh, you know, it was, it was absolutely worth it. And to be honest, it, it would have been worth it regardless of how it was how it was received because I've achieved what I wanted to achieve. Yeah. And I was really happy with the design. They're a bit like a birth, I think. It's like you mm. are putting one of your children out there into the world. I guess so. And so Not long quite as, it, as painful. So long as it yeah. gets well, I don't know, sometimes it is. Sometimes. It's pattern development, yeah. And actually my childbirth wasn't really painful at all, so, no. yeah. <laughs> I think we spoke story. about that in a radio show. <laughs> we did. So that That's the whole of the story. That episode three or four of the radio right. show. If you look back on our radio show feed, it's linked in the show notes below. You can go and hear that marvelous story. We're actually going to be doing another radio show, we a are. follow up radio show on parenthood quite yes, soon. Yes. But we'll speak up a little bit about that later on. So, Kay launched the Jelly Roll last time. Now, would you believe it? You've come back today and she's only launching another pattern. <gasps> I am. This won't happen every episode. No. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. That would be a nightmare. I think I had a heart attack. Yeah. It's just funny, isn't it? It's like a bus. 
You're yeah. waiting for one, and then two come along both at the same along. time. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be a lovely launch, actually, this one, it because is. it's a pattern that's inspired by our summer picnics. Yes. And it's the, the lovely Moss Eccles socks, and Kay will be showing you those in What's Off Your Needles. I and will. Officially launching them. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, it's interesting, I think, that it's fallen this way because it does specifically hark back to those picnics that we've enjoyed yeah. at Moss Eccles Tarn in the Lake District, which we always take in the summer. And suddenly, from nowhere, the summer weather's arrived. Do, do we look thrilled about this? <laughs> not, not particularly. <laughs> But that's okay. We've spoken about that before many times. <laughs> but yes, the summer weather's here, and to go with them. And it is a very, funnily enough, I do think it's a very summery pair of it's socks. A, it's a very summery pattern. The yarn I chose is more cut, sort of virgin on an autumnal colour, but the design itself is very summery, I yeah. think. Yeah. And speaking of summery socks, actually, one of the things I think that's hard to get when you are a person who wears knitted things, because you might not be a knitter, but you might enjoy wearing to things. Yeah. We need a name for those people. Yeah. Yes. Well, look, I, of course, I'm a knitter, mm -hmm. and I also enjoy wearing knitted things. That, that, that's, the, that's the crown jewels, isn't it? Because I bet you there's some knitters out there who don't like wearing knitted things. There's bound to be. To be fair, I prefer knitting for other people. Yeah. So, yeah. The challenge for me with socks has always been when the temperature's gone up, you need to have the right knitted socks to wear. Mm. And I never have had that until now. Uh -huh. I now am in oh. possession of three pairs of socks which are perfect for summer. Right. And they are the lovely ones which I'm wearing today, which yeah. are the, the leftovers most, the most recent of ones. the Boba Fett and yeah. the lovely yeah. Sherry Iris R2D2 yarn. Yeah. Also, I've got those lovely sort of Halloween-y looking ones with the broken rib. Oh, yes. Which are just perfect. But the, the absolute winners are the sort of pastel -y ones that are also ribbed. So that's three pairs of wonderful summer socks. And, you know, if, for me, and this is obvious, it's nice thin yarn. Yeah, yeah. And also short, shorty jobs. You don't, yeah. you don't want a long sock in, in summer. No, and I was going to knit you a an opal pair next, but actually it's a bit, it, opal is a bit of a thicker yarn, I think, than sort of like a 75-25 standard hand dyed. So what I might do is use the, this one. Yeah. I might use the moustache, the yeah. hand solo one. Perfect. As the next sock, I think that'd be cool. The real key though, is the ribbed or broken ribbed. Yeah. Th that when you put all those things together it creates just the perfect summer sock and I'm thrilled because historically I've struggled slightly mm, mm. so it's lovely to finally get to that point where because I literally cannot wear any other type of sock no and Brian is kind of the same you know she has to wear school socks for school obviously which are just sort of grey or white and she hates them because they are very sucky in and just feel uncomfortable on her feet when she's so used to hand knitted socks but I did find her some actually that she's gone off very happily in school today in a slightly more stretchy so so that was good but yeah she much prefers hand knitted now very quickly before we get on with the lovely show as we mentioned at the end of our last episode we are now more than a week into our youtube watch oh yes because on the first of with june with the adverts on the first of june youtube changed the policy so they could choose to drop adverts onto any or all content that they liked without any control from mm -hmm. us and as yet they've not done it not done it as yet so i'm actually really thrilled because mm. we were like when they said they were going to do this we're like you don't know if it's like that midnight it was just yeah. gonna click on or whether it would be a case of them working through everyone or it, are they going to look at things and are they going to say well okay we're only going to put them on for channels yeah. that get x it amount just of views don't, just, don't, just know. don't know it's just an unknown entity it is it is but just you know in case you missed at the end of our last episode if ads do suddenly appear at some point we have not turned them on no. And Bakery Bear patrons, you can, as I've now said, we said in the last show, we said in the most recent pop show, which came out last Sunday, and I've also now put out a how-to video to access 
all of our content, but specifically the Bakery Bears video show with no ads, using our brand new player, which you can access through our Patreon page, which I'm loving, actually. Yeah. You've watched a few things uh -huh. on it now. It's and been great. Have you had any problems at no. all? No. Which is just superb. It's funny, isn't it? Memories. They're, they're, they're interesting. The ones oh, that stay with you and the ones <laughs> that, that, that don't stay with you. And do you know what? One of my earliest memories of gifts, I mean, I do remember getting my first drum kit. Well... I'm not surprised. <laughs> but an earlier memory than that is my gran bought me the complete works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Really? It was a really thick book. Oh, right. It was a white cover. There was like a circle on the front, and inside the circle you could see like Holmes and Watson. Oh, they were right, like okay. drawn, it looked like. What in, happened to in it? In pen, I've got no idea. Oh, it's a shame. <sighs> it is such a shame. Yeah. And do you know what? I loved reading. I just loved reading that. It really got me interested really early on. And actually, a few years after that, about four or five years after that, I went to 221 Baker Street oh, right. on my own. But not a few years. I was like 16. Right. Yeah. You went by yourself? I did. You were in London by yourself at 16? I was with my mum. Oh, right. But my mum was... was doing something else oh, right. and I went and off you went off by your, on your own at 16 I did wow. I did, I did. and I went London. off I went off to 221 B Baker Street so clearly it started a love for me very young and it's perhaps for all of those reasons that in the last two weeks this house had a mystery fit for Sherlock Holmes really it did indeed and I have a title for this mystery Okay. Sherlock Holmes and the case of the missing sideburn. Oh, gosh. Oh, guess what happened? This was just, like, hilarious and just mortifying. It's just hilarious. All at once. It wasn't mortifying. It was for me. I had to look at it. What's it like Thanks now? Thanks a lot. Oh, it's kind of grown back. So I, I still cut Dan's hair. You know, we started What doing do you mean, that. Still. Take the still out of it. Well, no, I didn't used to. No, you didn't. But it, it, it sounds like that's going to end at some point. No, well, you know, Dan always went to a barber's just down the road. And what happened during lockdown, obviously, is all the barbers were closed. So I was cutting his hair during that time. But then, unfortunately, the barber's never reopened because... Well, she she did. Um, oh, she did briefly, didn't she? And then, and then I happened to catch her, and yeah. I got her on her last day, and she just said, I, I just can't make it work. No, no, no one's come back. Nobody, you know, people weren't coming back after lockdown, and she had to close, and I'm sure... This is tragic. There are many, many, many businesses yeah. where that's happened, unfortunately, during this time. So, you know, I said, oh, look, I'll just carry on cutting it. It's fine, you know. It's all right. I blooming love it. So anyway, I cut his hair last week. And then you always go off and just trim your sideburns down a little bit further. He came out of the bathroom this time and he went, something's gone a bit wrong. I was like, what's happened? He said, oh, well, it slipped from like a number two to a number one or something. Well, I can only assume that's what happened. Um, because I did this side and everything was fine. And then I ran it up this side. And he completely shaved off his sideburn. He side shaved burn. it off. Completely shaved his sideburn off. It was well, gone. My first reaction was just to laugh my head off. Too bad here? No, it wasn't there. It was just here. It was this one here. So it has grown back. It was sort of here. It just completely shaved it off. It's gone. So my first reaction was to laugh my head off for, you know, a good five minutes. But then I'm like, hang on a minute. You've got to walk around like that, looking like that with one sideburn. Do you know what? The great <laughs> thing about being me is it doesn't bother me. He wasn't. Yeah, I said, well, you don't have to look at him. Well, that's fine. But luckily, because it's like whisker hair there, isn't yeah. it? It's beard yeah. hair. It grows really quickly. And within sort of three days, it had pretty much grown back again. Hadn't it's it? pretty funny. We've got an adjustable <laughs> razor thing. Yeah, it's, it's a really not, good. You, you don't good. click on different ones. It's one, and you just adjust it yeah. to what you want. It's like a sliding scale yeah. sort of thing. And I think what must have happened is I must have just gripped it wrong because it went fine, and then I must have just gripped it and too it tight, went, and it slipped. <laughs> it was gone. Because that's what you do. You, you grip it and you slide it. So I, uh. what a fool! But that's fine. Sherlock Holmes solved the case, and three days later, everything had grown it back. It returned. It returned. Thank goodness. That's enough talk, because there's lots of lovely projects to see. Oh, yes. Yes. So without further ado, I think it's time that I ask, Kate Jones, what's on your needles? Hook. Oh. 
What is on your hook? It's a hook. She's throwing and a curveball. I am. I Literally. Yes. Because it's a curved needle. It's not it? a curved needle. Let me see. Since when is a crochet hook a curved needle? It's a needle and it's curved on the end. Oh, that's not curved. See, see, oh, it's get, a curve. Get on with you. Yes, I've started a new crochet project, everyone. Now, this is as a result of a birthday gift that I was sent by a lovely friend. And this is amazing. This is... Yeah, because Kay has different levels of friend. She's got <laughs> friend and she's got lovely friend. So if you send her a gift and she says, from a friend, you know that you're not very high up on the scale. If she says, lovely friend, then you know you're a good friend. This is terrible. This is not true, everyone. Ignore him, honestly. Get me into right trouble, you will. But yes, this was from a super lovely friend. Huh? Oh, there's a third level now. <laughs> and she sent me this box. And in the box was, and still is largely, because there's so many of them. Look, I'll tip it up and show you. Can you see? 50 mini skeins. You can forget about your advent nonsense, everyone. 50, I've got 50. It was worth turning 50 to get this. Isn't it funny though, the, the I mean, we've all been, yeah, there's all been, there's been challenges for everyone, hasn't there, over the last, but you know, this is a friend who we've seen, you know, two or three times a year, yeah. a, a, a knitting friend and meet up and maybe go for a walk, have a knit and a chat and all of that. And crumbs, we've she'll be retired by the I time know, we see her I know, we've not seen her now for, at least a year and a half. But then, you know, you think about... Probably longer. Think about parents. And yeah. you think about... You know, you, you might be thinking about sons yeah, and yeah, daughters yeah. and grandchildren. I think it's just now that people are starting to sort of see each other yeah, again, yeah, aren't yeah. they? Well, hopefully we might see this friend again sometime. Well, I might see her before I actually finish this, I'm hoping. Yes. That'd be really nice, wouldn't it? But yeah, look, 50 of these all beautifully wrapped. Look, she... Just think about the amount of time this must have taken her. And this is someone who, let me tell you, yeah. she, I You're don't know. You're not telling me I that by know. the time she got to 30, she was thinking stupid birthdays, <laughs> stupid friends. <laughs> Why couldn't How she be 30? <laughs> 35, it's a perfectly fine age. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but look, she, she's wearing them and they're all beautifully wrapped and they've all got these gorgeous numbers on and you know uh, I'm on about number 16 I think at the moment because what I'm doing is just Bryony said Bryony said how will this work you're 50 now so does that mean you can just open them all and I said no I can't do that as much as I kind of wanted to tear them all open I said no no I'm going to do it like an advent calendar I'm just going to do one every morning you know in my early morning knitting I'm just going to open one and they'll just gradually build up so I thought, right, what on earth am I going to make with this? Because they've got to stay as one thing. It was just such a special gift that I thought it's got to stay as just one thing. I knew I wanted to do crochet. I'm pretty, I was pretty certain I wanted to do a crochet project. And, you know, I've already got a granny stripe on the go. I've shown you that a couple of times. I didn't want to do a granny stripe. And I sort of pondered it for a while and then I just knew what I wanted to do. So I have started a blanket. So I'll put this one down. I haven't actually got a project bag for this yet because what I've been doing is putting them in the lid. You can see, look, can you see all the lovely yarns? And look how she's, oh, I mean, just look how, she's done little tiny centre pull balls. How amazing is this? And they've all got little bands with what they are on there. And I've, I want to put them into the blanket in the order that she's actually given them to me because that's part of, that's part of it. You know, she chose that order, even though she said, oh, I'm not very good at choosing colors. Now, now I know that we're probably preaching to the choir here, but this is the perfect example of, it's not about money. No. This is about time. If the, you put yeah, time absolutely. and effort into a the, gift, the amount it has, of, I just was just overwhelmed well, with how much time she spent beyond, doing this. It's beyond. Honestly, like, and I said to her, you know, how did you wind these? Did you have one of those fancy nostapinas? Nostapinas, and she said no. She just used a twenty millimeter knitting needle, you know, a great big thick knitting needle, and did these gorgeous. Who has twenty millimeter? I know. Do you it's have crazy. Any of those? No. But isn't this one beautiful? West Green Loft, this one. 
just gorgeous and all of the colours are just beautiful it's all of these she knows that I really love all of these pretty sort of soft pastel-y colours I think the beauty as well this one's this... Are gorgeous Mr and Mrs Rabbit yarns you'll not ever forget this no so I'll show you the blanket so yeah I'm just at the moment keeping it in the lid <laughs> Because I just love looking at them, you know, I sit the lid on top of the box and then I open one every day. This was today's that I opened. This is a Eden Cottage Brim and Four Ply in the colourway is Sand. Gorgeous sort of buttery colour. And because I want to put them in in the same order, I'm just writing the number on the band as well as they go into the blanket. This is a gorgeous one. This is Pastel Parade mini set from Ducky Darlings. Isn't that one beautiful? Just, they're all gorgeous. You know, they're all absolutely beautiful. But what I've started is a linen stitch blanket, Ooh. or moss stitch, or whatever you Have want you to call it. Have you ever done one of those before? No, I've done the triangle shawl. Can you yeah. see it there? Yeah. That I've shown you before. Do you know I did that triangle shawl in moss stitch, which I think actually I'm going to give to my mum. But I wanted to just do a, a you know, well, it'll be rectangular won't it by the time I've done and so I just looked up a tutorial on YouTube there's loads and loads and loads out there I just searched moss stitch or linen stitch crochet blanket and there was absolutely loads and I think it's I looked at a couple of them and it was done in exactly the same way so I think there's probably pretty much only one way of doing it and this is how far I'm in isn't it lovely look at the stitch I just love it so much and I'm getting each of the little balls is 10 grams so I've got 500 grams all together is that not amazing and this stitch I'll double it over and show you a bit closer I just love it because it's very solid and it looks like a, more like a woven fabric I think if I hold it close look it looks very much I think like a woven fabric it's just gorgeous and I'm just loving it and it's, it's, you know, I'm back to doing, I actually can do more than one row of this in the morning. This is way quicker. I, I chained 200 again, which is what I always chain for my granny stripe blankets because I know that's a good lap size for me. You know, it covers your entire body if you can see, look, oh no, hang on. There you go. Look, it covers your entire body and it's a great lap size. I thought, oh, it'll probably take me about the same amount of time as a granny stripe it's not it's way quicker and that's that must be because although you're working individual double crochets all the way across you with the granny stripe you're doing the clusters aren't you so you're doing three trebles and a treble takes longer to do than a double so I can get probably about three or even four rows done in the morning you know in, in sort of a half an hour time which is brilliant and each 10 gram mini is giving me about an inch of fabric so it's absolutely perfect. And I'm putting them in in the order that they came out of the, the, the gift. One thing I'm doing, right at the beginning I was struggling with finding what you have to do when you do the edge is you finish with a double crochet and then a chain, which is what it is all the way along. But on the edge, you have to do that into the chain the single chain from the row below so you've done a double crochet and chain and then you've turned so that chain that you've done becomes your turning chain and you have to then when you come back to that row at the end you've got to then do a double crochet into that chain from the previous row and right at the beginning I was struggling to find that chain because there's only one of them on that edge I was really struggling so what I'm doing now and it's working brilliantly well is when I make that chain and then I turn I'm putting one of these light bulb markers through can you see through that chain so I know that when I get back to it all I've got to do is sort of look at my marker try and hold this so you can see that I don't know if you can see look at where my marker is, find the chain that it's running through and that's where I need to put my hook. It's genius. I feel like I'm a genius. Obviously, that's not a big thing. But it's making the edge so perfectly straight. I'll show you this one because this is more sort of 
a bit longer. Can you see how lovely and straight that edge is? And it means I'm getting the, exactly the right stitch every time without having to worry about where exactly it is. So it's just lovely. I'm really, really enjoying it. And it just feels so special because of the, you know, the meaning behind it. You know what I'm like for the meaning behind projects. And it's everything for me, really. There's so much meaning in it. You know, I love the stitch pattern. Are you going to border it? Uh, yes, I'll put a border on. What do you think border you'll do? I don't know. I've no idea. I'll need to look it up. I've never seen borders on this. I'm not quite sure how I would work it, but I'm sure there'll be tutorials out there to show me how to do the border and I think I don't know I mean 50 inches long might be a tad too long so maybe I'll keep a couple of the minis to try and make them work for the border I don't know how much I'll need to go all the way around it by then maybe I'll keep two or three or something but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, the yarns, you know, the meaning behind it is so special. I'm really loving working the simplicity of the stitch pattern. I don't have to think at all. I'm just enjoying looking at how the colours are developing. This one I'm putting in is lovely. This one is Fibre Fox from a Sleeping Beauty mini set. And isn't it pretty pink? Like a blush pink. So it's just gorgeous. So, you know, if you are wondering what to do with a bunch of minis that you might have, I would really recommend this pattern. There's a couple of the yarns that are not challenging for me, but they're slightly thicker and it's just a particular base. And I, I know this base and I know it's thicker than a traditional fingering weight. And it's the one from Eden Cottage called Nate B. It's got silver in it. There's two here. I've already put one in. But I think it's way thicker. To be honest, I should. I think she should really market it as more of a sport weight. I don't know if you'll be able to tell if I hold those two up. You might not be able to tell from that, but this one is the Nate B. And it's just way thicker. And I actually started with one of those. And it's totally fine, but I can see the stitches are a bit bigger than the rest. And that's only challenging for me because I'm just such a neat freak. And I'm like, is this going to bother me? It may, you know, it's totally fine. I probably wouldn't bother 99.9% .9 of people. <laughs> Do you know what? It's been great because I've thought, I'm just going to go with it. I'm putting on my relaxed, chilled hat and I'm just going to go with it. And I'm going to put these in. It'll work perfectly and it won't be a problem at all. So that has been a good thing as well for me, just to sort of overcome that everything's got to be perfect thing, which it doesn't, does it, at the end of the day, because nothing in life is perfect. So that's been brilliant. And I'm using a 3.75 millimeter hook for this because this stitch pattern requires a slightly bigger hook size than you would normally use, I think, for the particular yarn you're using because it is a dense stitch. So I'd normally use three millimeter with fingering weight, but I'm using 3.75 and it works absolutely perfectly for me. But you might have to do a bit of swatching to sort of figure out what's good for you. But I get to use a pink hook as well, which that's another joy, isn't it? So absolutely loving that. Dan Jones. Yes. What's on your needles? I finished a sock. Oh, well oh my goodness. Would you believe it? It's taken a while, but it's because I messed up my bags and I had two socks on the go and I normally only have one sock on the go. Oh, right. I didn't mess up my bags. I wanted to knit these so much I just had to cast them on. Oh. And I did. There it's the McFlurry socks. What? It's the flurry socks. Do you remember McFlurries? Do yes. you still do them? I don't know. But whenever I Probably say flurry... Probably made out of like wallpaper think... paste or no, something. No, that was the milkshakes. Milkshakes. Yeah, but they were lovely. Didn't they put like plaster of Paris in or something? I don't or care was what that they... just a rumour? Well, let me tell you, I had one one morning and it tasted like plaster of Paris and that was the last time I had one. And that's a milkshake? Yeah. I've never had a milkshake. I then. used to, on the way to work, every morning, when I used to work in a music shop in York, I used to stop and get a strawberry milkshake. <gasps> Did you really? And I used to. How many calories must there have been in that? Didn't care. About... A 5, the thing is that it didn't matter at the time because I was drumming a lot and burning a lot. And you were very young. I was very young. With it. And I used to stop and get one every morning. And then this one particular morning, it, it tasted chemically. Oh, really? It did. 
and that was the last time I ever had one. Such a shame. I, no, I don't. Because do up until that point, I, I loved them. I don't do stuff like that at all. Really. The other thing I used to do as well is I used to stop in at York Railway Station and I used to pick up a raspberry Ribena. And they only did it for a short amount of time oh, yeah, they don't in do a car. That anymore. It was gorgeous. I remember that. I had a raspberry ribena and a boost at lunchtime. Right. This is a very healthy diet that you yeah. were having back then. Also, sometimes I would pop out to Thomas's just over the way and get a massive Chelsea bun. <laughs> And then other times, if I wanted something savoury, I'd get a huge pasty. What would happen if you ate all that in one day? Now? Always, I couldn't do it. Your, I think I your stomach would explode. Thing. I couldn't even have one thing. No, I couldn't eat any of that either. No one tells you that when you're young. No. Enjoy it when you're young. As soon as you get over 40... You're not be able to do it later. You stop being able to eat what you want and start having to eat what you have to eat. Yeah. Oh, yes. How boring. So these... I, well, do you know what? Well, I'm happy with the Well, you know, I we've eat. got very used to how we eat now, and it's a much healthier way to eat. You know, I need we, to write a book called The we, Joy of Spelt. Yeah, I mean, we eat very little wheat. We don't eat processed foods at all. No. Everything's made from scratch. No fizzy drinks, no sweets, no no cakes, really, not very much. And can I stress, this is not because we want to eat this way. Absolutely not. We would like to go and buy 50 cakes and eat them all. <laughs> I would. So we're not some preachy fools. Silly We're stomachs. doing it because our stomachs are useless. <laughs> But, actually, it's much better for us. So, yes. you know, we shouldn't complain, should we? I saw that Tibetan quote, didn't I, just the I other day? I posted it on Instagram. Oh, right. Oh, because it was, stealing my quotes. It was so lovely. Dan texted me this quote the other day, and it was so lovely, and it just made me think so hard that I thought, I'm just going to repost that on Instagram. So if you follow me on Instagram, go and have a look, and you'll see the quote. And the, the, the quote is a very simple one, and it is, the secret to a long and happy life is, eat half, walk double, and love treble. No, it wasn't. It was walk double. Laugh treble. That was it. And love without measure. Yeah. I'm sorry, I focused too much in on the love. Yes, you got it all wrong. <laughs> it's always been my problem. <laughs> These There's your sock. are my McFlurry socks. Oh. No, no, I mustn't do that because no. everyone will start calling them the, the, the McFlurry socks. The flurry. The flurry socks. And I've loved knitting these so much so that I've already cast on the next one. Well, of course I have. Now... You've done a very good job with this. This is my first... It's lovely. Two and a half mil yes. needle knitting. Sock. It's beautiful. I'll show you the pattern on the front. And thanks to the square needles, I'm now in the zone and I'm perfectly happy. And, you know, I can really feel like my abilities have improved, which is always great. I think when you're learning anything, when you're doing anything, if you feel like you're getting better, I think that's very encouraging. One of the things which I've learnt knitting the, the, these socks is I think probably the last four or five times that I've cast on something only when I'm knitting with DPNs. The last four or five times I've cast something on, I've knitted uh, probably two rounds and then I've looked at it and I've gone, I've twisted it and I've pulled it out and recast it on. And this time the same thing happened. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking I've twisted it and then I'm thinking about it some more and I'm thinking, do you know what? I haven't twisted it. It's just not evened itself out yet. I haven't knitted enough rounds for that mm. cast on edge to have got enough fabric in it to start looking normal. So I made myself carry on and it was fine. And what that shown me is, and I just wonder if other people do the same thing. Maybe I'm the only fool. It wouldn't surprise me. But you know how it pulls downwards on the cast on edge for the first two or three rounds? I, I honestly thought, and it's, also it does tend to pull around. It yeah, sort of pulls yeah, a bit and it makes yeah. you think, you, you look at it and you think, I'm sure that's twisted. The other thing though, that I'm really happy with. Your join's brilliant on this one. And actually I saw a technique recently. I, I watch all kinds of things and I read all the time just to try and pick up, you know, hints and tips and things that I can pass on. And I saw... Um, one recently where it was joining in the round on double points and what the person did was they cast on an extra stitch yeah. and then when they were joining in the round yeah. they passed that stitch over to the first needle and then it, it they passed that stitch over 
so the extra stitch was passed over the yeah. first stitch so that you joined in the round before you've actually started knitting that's what they did look at that though no but that's brilliant i would there's no problem at all with with that well just take a look at that and i'll tell you what i did did you do something different well i wouldn't say that that sounds like i'm clever <laughs> so what happened was i've done two rounds and i'm looking at it and i'm thinking i've twisted that and I'm thinking, I'm going to have to rip this out and start again. And then I looked at it some more and I thought, do you know what? I haven't twisted that. And it was pulling around. It was twisting around. So I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull. On the tail. On the tail. Yeah, and I pulled quite hard on the tail. Right. To snug it up. Uh, yeah, harder than I've ever pulled before. Oh, right. I, I, I really gave it a tug. Right. And it just sort of sucked all oh. together. And I'm like, it's all right. Right. I'll just carry on. So what I'm always going to do from now on is I'm not going to do it any earlier because I have a feeling that I might mess things up because if you'd only done one round and you pulled too hard, mm -hmm. I think you could be in a bit of bother. Mm -hmm. But because I'd done that couple of rounds and I felt secure in that there was enough there, two rounds were knitting, I'm not going to pull mm -hmm. anything off, gave it a nice tug. Brilliant. Right. So I'm always going to do that from yeah. now on. Do you think because I'm fairly... Uh, how do I describe? I'm fairly um, even in my tension, aren't you, yes, I? Yes, you're very. You've got a very even tension. Yeah. And I wonder if an, an even, fairly tight tension means that just by pulling down mm, on that, mm. perhaps if I was a bit looser with yeah, my, yeah. perhaps that wouldn't work. Maybe. Perhaps I'd end up with a super tight stitch. Yeah, could be. That would then maybe suck the other way because yeah, it was so tight. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I certainly don't think it's something that I would maybe say everyone should do. <laughs> No, but you know, it just everyone, works for me. You can find your own way, can't you? Yeah. And the yarn's really pretty, isn't it? It's a, a skein I dyed up that was the Cinderella's yeah. ball gown yeah. colourway. I love this shade of blue. It's so pretty, isn't it? I love it. So delighted to finish yeah. the first one and cracking on with the second you one. You are, you're doing really well. Thoroughly enjoying and it. And you cast that on the minute you finish this, yeah. you cast that straight yeah, on. Yeah, I have to. Good man. That's the way to do it. Look, I want to see what's on your needles. There we go, there's your sock. Thank you very well much. Done. I've got a sock to show. That's nice. Yay. And actually, I'm not far off finished a pair of socks. That's not normal, is it? To show you when I'm almost done with the pair. But this is, these are even. The socks that I started with the 1971 oh. colorway yarn oh. that I dyed up oh. on last the last time. show. So this is my 1971 colourway that I dyed up on the last show that you can dye up for yourself, you know, go and watch that one and dye up a skein if you want to. But look how fun, how fun is this colourway? I amazing. just love it. It still makes me think of sweets. Does it? Yeah. I'm just so thrilled with how it's turned out. It's everything I want in a variegated yarn. You know, there's no pooling as such, I don't think. Even like on the gusset here where you can get a bit, can't you, when the stitch count changes. The, the distribution of colours is slightly different on the gusset. I mean, it looks, again, slightly different on that side. It's a bit more even on that side. But there's no pooling, and it just is such fun. The colours are just, look how gorgeous and vibrant the colours are. So fun. So I used my crunkled socks pattern, which is one of my absolute favourites. It's perfect for variegated yarn. So if you did have a bit of a yarn that is, you know, you're a bit worried about what it's going to do, this, I think, just, it gives you that change in stitch pattern on a fairly regular basis, which means that it, it changes your tension slightly, changes your gauge because you've got knits and pearls and then you've got plain knits. So your tension is going to be slightly different in those sections and so it, it can muddle up colours a little bit better. I've knit it exactly to pattern. So it's got a slip stitch heel and then a lovely French heel turn and my umbrella toe and I use this purple as the contrast which I think looks lovely and this one I dyed up as well I think in the one before where I was dyeing yarn and this was the sorbet dye colourway from landscape dyes and I just thought that went really nicely so that's one sock completed and the second sock I've just finished the gusset decreases so I'm well on with it so here's the second one you know, almost really. Well, I'm onto the foot now, which is great. And as I'm sure you're all aware, Look. Kay's obsessed. When you consider the amount of amazing tutorials you've filmed over the years for sock knitting, 
But Kate's always trying to perfect her sock knitting and yes. make it even better. Yes. And she's just filmed, it's coming out in probably two weeks, a new way of yes. doing those perfect sock decreases. Yeah, and I'll to get gonna, them as neat. I'm just gonna grab as my other possible. blocker. It's a constant to quest. Put this on. Because it is, good a is never know, good enough. I've, no, and I don't think you will ever stop learning. You know, I'd, I'd, you might think, oh yeah, I'm really happy with that, and I was really happy with it, you know, and I'm I still tutor, really happy. I had a tutor when I was at college, and he said to me, the day that you say, oh, I'm cool with that, yeah. and you stop trying to get better, is the day when you've stopped climbing the mountain, mm -hmm. and you're starting the journey back down Absolutely. again. Absolutely. New things are all always coming out yeah. all the time yeah. and there could be an old technique that that's from the 1930s yeah. that you suddenly discovered and you're like wow that's brilliant that you didn't know about so it's a and I love that about what we do because there well, is always it's about anything it's about anything it's in life things. isn't yeah. it if you're open to learning and I actually like learning more now than I did when I was at school I think a lot of adults will probably say that I yeah think. yeah yeah so but what dan's referring to is i saw recently and i can't for the life of me remember where i saw it i'm really sorry because i just watch loads of stuff if something pops up on youtube a recommendation that looks interesting i'll watch it and i'll just store it away or it might have been something i've read in a book that i've pulled out so i'm not sure where i saw it but i have done a, a video tutorial for our patrons on this but it's on an ssk now, do you know how, and you will know if you're a sock knitter, how, or any kind of experienced knitter, a knit two together decrease, for me, always looks super neat. But an SSK, you can kind of see it in the fabric, and it's just because of the nature of it and the way that the stitches are worked. Now, what I've been doing recently, which I've found works really well, is... On an SSK, I've been slipping the first stitch as if to knit, slipping the second stitch as if to purl, and then knitting them together as you would do normally. And that produces decreases that look like that. And I think it's perfectly neat. And I was very happy with that. Now, I saw this technique and I thought, I'm gonna try that on my second sock, because I, had, I was almost at the gussets and I was like, oh, I'm gonna try that. I thought, I wasn't convinced that it would work, but oh my goodness, look at this SSK. You're going to be so excited. Can you see? These are the SSKs. Now let's see if I can hold them both together at the same time. I don't know if I'll be able to. There we go. Can you see the difference? Amazing. It's the neatest SSK I have ever ever seen and the other thing that it does is do you know how sometimes you can get a bit of a gap well that seems to have disappeared as well and there doesn't seem to be a gap Sarah from Love Sock Wool if you're watching I remember Sarah on a podcast episode of hers ages ago years ago probably she was going on about an SSK and saying it was a bit gappy then you know that's how neat that SSK is and I think that's just stupendous. I think it's next week the tutorial comes out, so, so don't yeah. miss it. Yeah, I mean, check that out. Cool. It's brilliant. So, you know, fa fantastic. So that's my lovely 1971 crunkled socks. Almost complete. And I'll have a nice chunk of the yarn left, I think. I bet I'll have at least... 30 grams if not a bit more i'm using two and a half millimeter for these socks actually just because i fancied it no other reason i just fancied a pair of socks that had a bit more relaxed feel because i do tend to wear my socks more as kind of slipper socks i really like that and i thought because these were nine you know that special colorway that might be nice just to have them to wear around the house cool yeah lovely lovely nine rows to go until the collar <gasps> Is that all? Yeah. Do you not need to change the needle sound? Well, you look. You can hold it up and show everybody. Right, hang on. I've got too many sock blockers. Nine rows, know. and there's two lots of decreases to come. So I'd be willing... To, I reckon I'll get away with another decrease round, because it's still fairly... Look, it's still fairly bunched so up. So this is still on a 32 inch, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so another decrease round to come, and then there's another decrease round after that. Does it rapidly decrease at any point? Because that's a huge hole at the moment. Well, yeah, it's got a half. 
Oh, right. It's halving every time. Oh, right, okay. So it is rapidly decreasing. This is Dan's... Is it Ridari? Yeah. I mean, you can see that's coming in. I was holding that Look, too high, I think, wasn't I? You can right totally there. see that's coming in on the Look shoulders. Can't, can't you? Are you happy with that? It's got a Burberry look about it. Don't you think these are like Burberry colours? Look, 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 look. That's coming in nicely on the shoulder, isn't it? I'm looking. It, it's a bit big for me, but... Yes, I realise that, but are you comfortable and happy with how that's coming in on the shoulder? It's not for me. I realise that. Look at the shoulder and tell me if you think it looks okay. There's a screen right there. <laughs> yes, darling, I think it looks great. Great, because you just expressed some concern about the, 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 the decreases. But you said you've got another how many rows of decreases to I've go? I've got two rows of fairly rapid decreases right. to go. Right, so you're um, halving them each time. Well, and that's really coming sharply, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. So we're okay. Yeah. Good. I just I don't want to get through it and then there'd be a problem. I'm going to call this your designer Ridari because I think people at Burberry who might be watching <laughs> would say, "Ooh." Well, that's the designer that's designed it. Yeah, I know. We didn't choose. And I'd love I'd like to be all. able to pronounce her name, but I can't. No. But it's the Ridari, as I'm sure you all remember. In fact, I should. I oh, know. You see, I've looked on Ravelry and I. It, she doesn't look like a very easy to, person to get in touch with. Oh, right. Because I'd love to know. I'd love, she, she actually lives in America. Oh, right, okay. I'd just love to know, because her name She's, looks is she beautiful. Iceland? She must be Icelandic. Yeah, but, but, definitely. But her name just looks beautiful. Right. I wish I had a cool name. You do have a cool name, it's because cool. every time we go into Waterstones, we see several books. Yeah, that's how common I am. By Dan Jones. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about that. We don't talk about the other Dan Jones. With his tattoos. We're and not his, a fan. <laughs> We're not a fan. But yes... Nearly there, and I can tell you now, after experiencing, I spoke before at well, length. Let's put it on you. I spoke before at length about how Ooh. it's challenging doing more than two strands of colour work with the Let Lopi. It really is challenging, and actually, Brilliant. so so three strands is just it, it's not pleasant. Two strands is fine. I think actually knitting the three-stranded work has made the, the two-stranded feel like normal now. So I'm really grateful that I did that because I'm definitely enjoying it more. And I think that that's going to put me in a really good position when I get to the yoke on the anniversary jumper, the other one that I'm knitting. What's that? It smells like a sheep. Well, no, that's fine. That's fine. I've already thought about when this will debut on screen time mm. on, on the show. And I'm quite excited about oh, it. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I, I'll cause... stand a bit so you can see the whole thing. Look. Isn't it's cool, amazing? isn't it? It's cool. I mean, it, it's been the it's most... It's a dress on me. That'd be quite cool. <laughs> it's been the most wonderful experience knitting it, to be honest. You know, everything about it has been great. I've learned so much and, you know, been wonderful trying this yarn, which has, you know, been great. And, you know, my colour work skills have definitely improved a lot. And... I think they're perfect. I mean, look, well, I'll try and hold... Well, honestly, anybody... I mean, look... Anybody, any knitter out there, you'd be happy, you'd be thrilled. I'd be thrilled if I'd done that. It could be in a shop. Like, you know, people would pay good money for this in Iceland. Yeah, but they couldn't pay me enough. <laughs> that's the and thing, that's the isn't thing. it? Yeah. That's the thing yeah. with knitting. You know, you do, yeah. sometimes you'll get people saying, won't you, oh, will you make one for me? As if, like, it's nothing. I'm afraid not. A non-knitter, I don't think... It's not their fault. They just don't appreciate how long these things take. Yeah. And you can never, ever... I don't think you could ever really make money, not proper money, out of no. selling knit, you know, things that you've made knitted-wise. Because it just takes so long, doesn't it? You can never charge enough to cover your time. What I'm happy with is I'm absolutely happy with... To an extent, that there isn't really any yarn dominance. No. There is sometimes a little bit, but you know, I know I what I I've done. There is. I know what I've done differently, and I know how to rectify that. What I'm not completely happy with is still you can see a difference. It's loads better than it was. It's like in a different league to where it was, but I'm still not happy with the difference in gauge between here and here. It's close. It's close. It's slightly bigger. Yes. But, and I'm know, not happy with that. That's okay. So I'm going to rip it out and start again. Oh, no, get no, I'm on. Not, I'm not, I'm not at all. Uh, but, you know, learn from it, and I know that next time I'll be even better again. So I'm going to finish this imminently. 
So who knows? Poke me in the the eye next time you see this, <laughs> it might be what's off your knees. Oh my goodness. In the height of summer, he finishes. Yeah, that's so I won't be putting it on. An I'll be debuting jumper. this on something special. Well, you've got to just try it on for me to see. Of course. Yeah. But I'll be debuting this for something very special later on this year. Right. What else is off your needles? Well, the last thing I've got to show you today is Dan's walking hat. Oh, marvellous. Because I'm, I'm now at the decreases. Well, I've got a, a lovely lavender sachet in there. Keep it away from me. I wonder if that came from Sherry. Keep it away from me. Sherry, was this one of yours? I'm not sure. I, I do that with all, you know, if you, you guess, oh, it might be Hedra Yarns. She, no, she just sends them in a little bag. That might be Sherry, it's lovely. This is the hat that I'm knitting for Dan for when he's, did I say walking? I didn't say running, did I? I think I said walking. But it's a kind of walking the dales, walking the moors hat. Because I just didn't like the one he's been wearing. <laughs> So I wanted to look at a nicer hat. <laughs> so it's a completely selfish. Who problem. cares if he's comfortable? <laughs> Who cares if it's doing the job it needs to this do? This will be even more comfortable. This this yarn's like butter. So here's where I'm up to, and I'm just about to start the decreases. So what I've done for the pattern for this is I actually took it, took inspiration from one of my own designs. I'm not sure what that is called. Can you be inspired by something that you've actually designed? I don't yeah. know. Um, but this was part of the... from anywhere. Yeah, I suppose so. This was one of the stitch patterns in the Christmas Tide Cowl, which was last year's Advent knit-along design. And I just loved it. And it's panels of stocking stitch with a cable inserted in, but the cable is just kind of hanging out there. It's not bordered by pearl stitches. So it gives a much more gentle look I think and then we've got some garter bands that are separating them and I deliberately sort of worked out the stitch count so that it would flow into the rib really nicely so I've knit about it's about seven inches here now because Dan's head is more on the larger side so I wanted to make sure that it covers his ears. But I generally, actually, for me, I would knit a hat to about seven inches because I do like it really tucked down well over my ears. But, you know, everyone's different. I know some people prefer it sort of not quite covering their ears. So, yeah, I'm ready to start the decreases. And it actually took me ages to work out the decreases. I think I've figured them out now and I've charted it out. Listen to me. Look at me charting things. I didn't even write it out longhand. I just did a chart for the decreases. Um, so hopefully it'll work. But what I've done with the decreases, I wanted to maintain the cable for as long as I could up the decreases. So I've worked the decreases into the stitches that are either side of the cable on each of the sort of panels. And then, but that if, I mean, if you were to do that, that's quite a lot of decreases on the round. So what I did is I've, I've put more knit rounds, more, you know, non-decrease rounds in between to sort of spread them out a bit. And looking at the number of rows it's produced, I think there's about 17 rounds on the decrease section. And I've compared that to like the running hats that I've done for you before, and it's just one row different. So I think that will I think that will work, hopefully. So I'm hoping to have this finished for next time. Cool. But it, I think it'll just be a really nice, really nice hat. And the yarn is gorgeous. I mean, you feel how soft it is? It's lovely. It's really, really beautifully soft. It's from the Uncommon Thread. And it's the Everyday Luxury, so it's 100% superwash, extra fine merino. And you get 360 metres for 100 grams. So it's slightly thicker of a fingering weight yarn. And the colourway is smudge. It's that colour that's not quite grey and not quite brown, I think. It's just gorgeous. Really lovely. Something weird's happened to that end of my cake. Look, it's sort of coming out. <laughs> So I'm hoping to have this finished next time and I'm using three millimetre needles. So yeah, I'm, I'm super pleased. But again, I'm going to finish it right in the middle of summer so it'll be the autumn probably before you actually see this on Dan's head. We'll show you obviously when it's finished. But I'm really enjoying that and I'll be glad to get it finished for you. Ready 
for a lovely walk. Yes. And speaking of a lovely walk. Oh, that was a good Can you believe segue? that it is nearly, in nearly, it's exactly a year tomorrow wow. to the day that we published our very first Walk in the Dales. Gosh. So to celebrate the anniversary of a show which, you know, we're really humbled by how much you guys have enjoyed it. So thank you all over the year for all your messages. And, you know, we love making it. It's something that we developed together and, you know, that it really feels like the show that we've always been destined to produce, along with my favourite colourways as well, really. You know, two shows that mm. came out of, you know, the, the horrible period that was last year but actually if if ever there was an example of a good thing mm, coming from mm, a bad thing it's always a good thing that was most yeah. certainly it so to celebrate the year anniversary of walking the dales it's time for us to head back to the dales and for kevin and i to set out on a truly epic adventure Welcome everyone to a brand new season of walks. Over the next few months we'll be undertaking five hikes in the Yorkshire Dales and five hikes in the North York Moors. We're going to be walking through a landscape I've spent the last 35 years exploring and I can't wait to share with you some of my favourite destinations and the stories that surround them. From mysterious castles to beautiful forests and long forgotten villages, in this series we're going to undertake some wonderful adventures. But where are we heading today? Welcome, everyone, to Swaledale in the heart of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. This is a walk I've been saving for a special occasion because you do not get anywhere more quintessentially Yorkshire Dales than this. Our walk today is going to be focused on some of my favourite places in all of the Yorkshire Dales. We're just a stone's throw from the village of Reef, once famous for its hand knitting. And on the way here, we actually drove through Grinton, so beautiful that its village church was actually used in the original series of All Creatures Great and Small. But that's not the reason we're here. This part of the world is full of fascinating earthworks that are just crying out to be explored. As we venture along the trails today, we're going to be discovering a history that dates back two and a half thousand years, and we're going to uncover the story of this stunning dale. This is going to be a little bit special. Just take a look at what's in store.
What I'm most excited about today though is the way that I've structured this walk. And whilst I would love to take credit for that, it's not me at all. It's this landscape because it's going to open up before us like a book. We're going to start our walk up on Harker Side Moor and it's going to take us back to 600 BC. And then as we come down off the moor and pick up the swale and follow its route as it meanders towards Grinton and Reith, we're going to slowly but surely travel back to the future. Who would have thought you didn't actually need a DeLorean to travel in time? You just need a pair of swishy trousers and a tilly hat and you're off. So let's get these babies up to about seven miles an hour as we once again go walking the dales. I mentioned earthworks, didn't I? And they're pretty impressive as well. <laughs> At least we hope they're gonna be. Many of you might be wondering though, what is an earthwork? Well, if you look it up in a dictionary, it'll tell you a fairly boring explanation. It says, an earthwork is a large artificial bank of soil sometimes used as a fortification. And it's the second part that's interesting because many of these earthworks, many of these fortifications date from the Bronze Age. So they could be anything up to 5,000 years old. Now, the very first people to settle in Swaledale permanently arrived a little bit later than that. And we're actually in search of the earthworks for their home. And they arrived, as I say, a little bit later because it was about two and a half thousand years old. But that's still pretty impressive, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I'm rather excited to see what's in store.
The question is, what were these Bronze Age fortifications protecting? Well, archaeologists believe they've got the answer and it lies just across this moorland. We're on our way to Maiden Castle, which started out life about two and a half thousand years ago as a hill fort. Now, hill forts are a really interesting thing because when we stopped being hunter-gatherers, when we started to first, humanity I mean now, when we started to first settle into permanent homes, the places that we did that were hill forts. Basically what they were was a bit of high ground that was surrounded by a fortification to protect us from other tribes and animals. And because they were up high, and because they were fortified, modern archaeologists tend to call them forts, hence the name Hill Fort. And Maiden Castle is unique, as far as I'm aware, in the world, because something rather special has happened here, and I can't wait to show you. Whoa. This is it. We stood in the centre of Maiden Castle. Around about 500 BC, this would have been the heart of a small community. Now, what would have been here? Well, all around me, inside its protective outer wall, its outer earthwork, would have been roundhouses. Now, these were small walled houses, wattle and daub walls. And then on top of those walls, there would have been a very tall circular roof. And in the top of the roof, there would have been a hole to let out the smoke from the fire, which would have been burning in the center of each of these roundhouses to cook on and to keep the people warm, you know, who lived in the roundhouse. Now, this is amazing. It's the first time I've ever been inside a hill fort, but these places are fairly common. There's something that makes this place unique because this is the only roundhouse ever found in the world with a 390 foot, 17 feet wide entrance corridor. And you've really got to see this to believe it. This is beyond stunning. It's also really tricky underfoot. I, I'm, I'm gobsmacked, to be honest. I've been, I've been fortunate to go to places like Stonehenge before. And I mean, I, I would put these things, th 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 this is up there. I'm sort of lost for words, folks. The sheer length of this is just, it's mind blowing when you consider the effort that this must have taken. And these stones haven't been put here by farmers recently. Th th this was part of the enclosure. This was the entrance. Now, th the question that you're asking is, why on earth was this put here? 
Well, the consensus seems to be as follows. Maiden Castle started out as a, a, a place where people lived, as a hill fort, and it was, you know, protected by its boundary and its earthwork on the outside, and there would have been a gateway. But then, as the years progressed and people started to feel safer, they moved out into the countryside, and Maiden Castle was left, and no one was living here. Now, it seems that the people who moved out considered this place to be sacred. And the fact that this is 390 foot long tells you that it must have been processional because you did not need this type of entrance for protection. And the other thing that's really interesting as well about it is of course that it starts low and it gets higher as you get further up towards it. So it seems that the people who moved out into some of the settlements that we're gonna see later on in our walk maybe treated this place perhaps like a cathedral and they would come here and potentially use this to bury people. Similar to a much bigger version of the cairn that we visited in an earlier walk in this series. I'm astounded by this place. It's wonderful. It really was a long way up. I didn't realize quite how much I'd climbed. But we're, we're nearly there. We're nearly off the moor, heading down towards the rather gorgeous River Swale. And you may have noticed the summer gear is out now in full force. Alan Grant came out last episode, didn't he? My wonderful Tilly hat. But you may notice I have on these strange things around my wrists. Well. The moors can be an absolute nightmare for bugs. So we got these great ones for keeping away the midges, but also as well, as I'm sure many of you will know, the, uh, the winner seems to be, I don't want to tempt fate though, I'll end up getting bitten loads today, but it's the, oh, what's it called? Skin So Soft from Avon. It works like an absolute charm. I'll spray that all over my legs. <laughs> So I don't want to take my trousers off later and be covered in bites. Oh no. So we've left Maiden Castle and Harkerside Moor behind us. And we're now heading off in search of the river which gave the dale its name the swale and it's one of my favorites because it's so fast flowing but before that we've got a traditional yorkshire dales farmyard to get through
Whilst Dublin Farm is a little bit more modern than Maiden Castle, <laughs> it was to the land either side of the Swale here, just down from Maiden Castle, that the residents came to take their first steps into living outside of the hill fort. This was the land which became the fertile soil because of the River Swale flowing just down, quite a long way down to our left. It, it was perfect for Swaledale's first farmers, and really ideal for the, the residents of Maiden Castle to begin to feel safe outside the walls of their hill fort. It was because of that reputation for rising quickly that the river got its name. From 450 AD to 1066 AD, pretty much all of this country was ruled by the Anglo-Saxons. They were a Germanic tribe who were actually invited in by the Celtic tribes of England and they pretty much, they stayed and they ended up taking over the majority of the country. And it's for that reason that a lot of the names that they gave to landmarks live on. Now then, somewhere down this trail lies a lovely footbridge across the swale with great views of the biggest settlement on today's trail, Reef. So whilst I try and find that, you guys head off for a nice cup of tea and a slice of cake, and I'll see you later for more Walk in the Dales. I was stunned to be honest. I mean, you, you may have noticed in that first half there was a couple of times I was sort of struggling for words because beautiful. You don't expect to find in this country. It's sort of different. It was different when we went to Italy. I think because there was so much more, so much more amazing ancient history there. Mm. When it's all around you, I think that it gets less d d descended upon. Yeah. That's certainly what we found. There was things that. We said when we went to Italy that would be like cordoned off and people would be charging yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in, in Italy, you know, it was just open to everyone. Well, this is just like that. Mm. Especially when you consider, if you've been to Stonehenge, how well sort of protected that is. And so it should yeah, be. Yeah, you can't get to the stones anymore, can No, you? because, you know, so many people visit it, you know, you wouldn't want mm. it to be d destroyed. Well, this, 
it's just totally different. You know, there it is, huge. <laughs> I it's didn't amazing. expect it, it to be the amazing. size it was. You know, they should rebuild those walls, shouldn't they? The stone's all there. How amazing would that be? It's really funny, though, because then there's another part of it which I love the fact yeah. that it's just not been touched. No, and some bits I noticed when you got the camera down low, some bits of the wall at the bottom were still... Mm. There were a few layers of stone. Of course, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Just the most wonderful mm. place. And then now, of course... We're exploring that gorgeous river and it's quite low because it's been, after having a lot of rain, it's, it's, been, it's suddenly it's gone the other way. Th yeah, we've either been very dry or then very wet and then very dry. We're in a sort of quite a dry period again now, aren't we? It's yeah, but not, still. Not very English at all. No, but still, you know, it was, it was a, a holiday when I was there filming mm. last week and there was quite a few people around. Mm. But the Dales is such a big place that even though there was quite a few people around, it's still... You were there by yourself. There was no one else there marvelous. when you were there. Yeah, which is just well, in itself that's amazing, you're, isn't it? You're, are you talking about the hill fort? Yeah, yeah, the hill fort. I don't think people go up there. Right. That's certainly, you know, from... It's, all it's, I mean, that's such a, in a way it's a shame, but then in another way it's not because it keeps it protected, doesn't it? It does keep it protected and it also means that you found the perfect picnic spot. Yeah, I mean, oh, that yes. would have been amazing. Yeah. No, no, what do you mean? Would have been, oh, will you did. be. Did you have We're your going. Did, oh, did you have your picnic there? Yeah, I stood on top of the earthwork looking down at the hill fort. Yeah. The, I wouldn't call it a picnic. You had your food. I ate my jerky. No, you took something else. Yeah, I do, but I have it in stages. Oh, I right, don't okay. eat, eat everything at once. You just I walk sort of, and eat. Well, you graze. I always stand and have something and then move on mm. but I, I don't like do it all at once now th there's so much to come because later on in the show we're going to be finding a village that's famous for hand knitting yes oh yes and so much more besides but all that's to come in part two don't miss that it's coming later on the show but right now it's time for me to ask Kay Jones what's off your needles I've got two things which is exciting the first is my Bargello hat. You know, I was working on this last time and I finished it. It took me no time to finish those decreases. Chunky weight yarn's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Just goes in a flash. Absolutely love it. You could knit this easily in a day. You know, it really takes no time at all. But I'm really pleased with how it turned out. Shall I pop it on? Because my hair will take it, I think, today. That's the back. The other thing with this pattern is, do you know how you will you will see a jog, won't you, within a striping thing quite easily? And there are ways of disguising a jog. I never bother, to be honest, because it just never bothers me. I just stick it to the back of my head and I don't even see it. But with this pattern, can't really see it at all. The jog is, is like here, here. And I think you can really barely see it, which is brilliant. So I'll pop it on. Look how cute. Oh, I can't wait to wear this. It's quite a nice sort of one to wear towards Christmas, isn't it? With the colors, I think. Definitely. It's really nice. And the yarn's lovely. Now I'm gonna muck my hair up when I take it off. But... So I used two different chunky weight yarns. They were both from Stylecraft. So the red colour was Bellissima Chunky and the brownie colour was just Stylecraft Special Chunky. The brown was Mocha and then this red was another colour that I can't remember. I said on the last show. But that's all finished. So this is all ready now to start recording the first... I don't, well, I don't know if this will be the first, but this is ready to record one of the Knitty You tutorials because this pattern well, forms actually, part... Well, actually, you think that will be the last? I so. think this will be the last. I think I'm doing, doing it in order of thickness of yarn because sense. I've got one project that's fingering weight, one that's DK with a mohair, and one that is chunky. So I'm going to go from fine up to thickest, I think. So I think this will be the last, the third of the patterns. So, but this will be part of my Knitty You this summer, which will be starting next month. Yes. But we're all set to start recording those now. We'll be getting on with that. And I just, I really, really enjoyed it. I think it's just a great introduction to this kind of slip stitch colour work. 
this has been blocked, washed and blocked. Acrylic's weird, isn't it? When you when you wash it, it it's really stiff and it's very it's a very odd thing. It's not you know in any way like wool when you block it because when you wash wool it becomes it goes very floppy, doesn't it? And really like you can stretch it dead easy. This was like the opposite. It was re really stiff and sort of a bit squeaky, but it's lovely when it's dry. It's super soft. Beautiful. You can throw it in the washer. So that's all finished and ready to get cracking with the Nitty You. And then the second thing I've finished is my new pattern launch. So these are the Moss Eccles socks. Wow. That green is just beyond amazing, isn't it? Yes. So these socks are inspired by Moss Eccles Tarn in the Lake District which we go to every time we're in the lakes and we have a picnic and it's just lovely. We've been, I think, three times, four times maybe now, three, and had a picnic there. It's always boiling hot when we go. Let's hope it won't be quite so hot this time. Moss Eccles Tarn, if you don't know, is or was the inspiration for Beatrix Potter, her character of Jeremy Fisher. She imagined that Jeremy Fisher lived at Moss Eccles Tarn, which he absolutely could. You know, if, you, if you've ever been there, it's just the most perfect location. It's quite a steep climb up to it. It's not really that far, because when you're walking back down again, you seem to get back down to the village in no yeah, time. Yeah. But walking up, it's quite a steep climb. And then you come to this tarn high up, and it's got kind of big rocks around one side of it, and the other side has got loads of trees, and there's always loads of ducks on there. And it's just really, you know, the location is just gorgeous. It's really lovely. So when I saw this colour of yarn... I just knew I had to design something with it. I just fell in love with it. And then the pattern, so as the pattern emerged, it made me think of, I must have had, you know, the tarn in my head. And it just made me think of like ducks flying in to land on the tarn and then the ripples that they form as they land on the water. So I used Eden Cottage Yarns and it's the Rosedale four ply which is an 80, 15, 5, 80% merino, 15 nylon, 5 gold stellina. And it's in the colourway algae, which was just perfect. So it's Eden Cottage. And this is what I've got left. So I've got a nice little chunk left. There's probably maybe 25 grams left, left there. I hope you can see that you might be able to see the sparkle actually there. I can see it on screen, so hopefully you can. It's the most perfect green ever. Oh, I still love it, even after knitting two socks with it. So it's this lovely lacy pattern, so that's why I think it's perfect for summer. I know I've used this green, which is more kind of autumnal, but you know, you can use whatever colour you want. And I think, the, you know, like I said, the lace is just a lovely summery knit. So these are now available for purchase on Ravelry and Lovecraft, so it's Moss Eccles Socks. Beautiful. If you would like to knit your own froggy pair of socks. I'll be casting on those as soon as I finish the flurry socks. Yeah, Dan wants to do them. Oh, yeah. It is, it's a lovely repeat. The, you know, the stitch pattern is, it keeps you, it very much keeps you engaged, but you do very quickly get into the rhythm of it. So for me, it's the perfect combination. Great. And it's got my umbrella toe and a traditional heel flap, gusset and turn. That's enough finished objects oh yes it's time for us to get back yes. to finish off our wonderful walk in Swaledale will we find the lovely bridge with the great view over wreath and what else will we discover maybe a little bit of all creatures great and small ah. history as we finish off our gorgeous walk in Swaledale so let's get back and enjoy some more walking the dales Dales. Now we've left the swale behind us 
because this is a floodplain here and I can see that there's water coming off it actually. The farmer's got all sorts of things going on to try and get as much water off the field as possible, but I suspect it would be a little bit boggy if we walked through there. Now, as we make our way towards the village of Reeth, we're slowly but surely traveling forward in time, but there's still echoes from those very first residents of Swaledale as they came out from Maiden Castle and started to farm the land either side of the river, they put in something called cultivation terraces. And there's some wonderful archeological remains of just that, just over there. Amazing, isn't it? I'd never actually seen anything quite like that before in the north of England before. They're quite common in the south. Just take a look at this. And it's down, I think it's in Dorset. And it's ingenious what they've done because they've positioned the cultivation terraces around the hill fort. So you've got the best of both worlds. You've got defenses and you've got land that you can farm. Absolutely ingenious, isn't it? But look at that. Before us, finally, lies the bridge that we've been looking for. And just over the hill in front of us is the wonderful town, well, it's a village actually, of Reith. was probably the sheep farms that are all around um, the, the river Swale that led to the proliferation of hand knitters in Reith. And supposedly people used to travel from all over the dales and in fact the country to get their hands on a Reith sweater. I can tell you this though, I don't need one today. Summer is most definitely here and there couldn't be a better spot to take in this gorgeous Yorkshire Dale.
Welcome to the land of the buttercups. My goodness, I really enjoyed the downhill and the flat along the swale. It's time to climb that now. And this really is steep. That really has to be one of the joys of walking in the Yorkshire Dales. You're following the map, you come across a field, doubting that the map is correct. It is correct when you get across the field and you get the treat of walking straight through someone's little garden. As you carry on, your lovely walk is marvellous. Look at the views. Goodness me. It is a perfect day for walking in the Yorkshire Dales, people, let me tell you. Wow. Neil, just sort of ahead of me, just to my left, on the horizon really, is the gorgeous village of Grinton. And it's claim to fame. Is it, at, it was one of the locations used in the last ever episode of the original series of All Creatures Great and Small. That aired, I think it was either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day in 1990. Goodness me, I'd ever miss an episode of that. It seems like only yesterday, how time flies. Whilst we've raced forward in time as we followed the trail along the swale, what I love about this landscape is it never stops reminding you how ancient it is because there's just a hill, a, a rise, literally. We're walking parallel to it now. And that's one of the circular earthworks that emanate out from Maiden Castle, which lies about two miles over in that direction. It's fascinating stuff and it really does ground you and make you appreciate how wonderful this part of the world is. Would you believe? that this was Alfred Wainwright's favorite dale. My goodness, it seems that whenever we go for a walk, we always find traces of the rather wonderful Mr. Wainwright. He certainly did have good taste though, my goodness.
so we're circling up around the deer park now. And it makes total sense actually that a deer park would have been here because the, the, the manor house of this region, Swale Hall, is about half a mile in that direction. And no doubt this is where they kept the deer that used to end up on their tables. But that earthwork that we mentioned is literally right here. The one that was back down that way about half a mile. We've picked it up again and it's really coming up and circling round with us as we come around this deer park with lots of little sheepy friends. <laughs> Wouldn't be the Yorkshire Dales without some sheep. Goodness, this is a real backbreak. The climbs are really quite steep, but the views are spectacular. It's the last leg of our walk. And we've ended up back on Harker Side Moor where we started. And the reason why we've come back here is, it's impossible to see, but we're walking through a landscape which archeologists have found stone circles on. So what we're looking at here are cairns in effect. What we went searching for earlier on in the series, they're burials. And there was quite a few. You can actually see stones up on the horizon. Now these burials, quite a few of them, it's evident that they would have been hunter-gatherer so what that tells archaeologists and what that tells us is prior to anyone coming and settling here they would have been passing through living in caves and you know hunter-gatherer activity before we settled into hill forts and round houses and you can sort of imagine can't you that when someone came up with that idea I know what we should do. We should stop moving from place to place. We should lay down some roots, <laughs> build a home. And I know the perfect place to do it. Do you remember those cairns where we buried great aunt Esther? It had a great view. Why don't we go and build a hill fort there? It's <laughs> refreshing to think that after 2000 years, where you live is still all about location, location, location. My goodness, did they pick a good one. I believe it. The car is on the horizon and our walk in the Dales is nearly over. But what a walk it's been.
I said at the start of this walk that Swaledale would open up before us like a book. And I wasn't wrong, was I? Picking up the story of those first inhabitants of Swaledale at Maiden Castle and then following their journey out into the landscape around them. It, to me, it felt a little bit like tracing a family tree. And do you know something? I think it was a family tree because we all come from somewhere, don't we? And if you have Yorkshire roots, there's every chance that perhaps it was one of your ancestors that first settled here at Maiden Castle and then turned this dale into the stunning part of the world that it's become. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time when we'll once again be walking the moors. Well. Oh, so lovely. Didn't you love? What an amazing... Can I tell you my favourite bit? The end. <laughs> oh. My favourite bit is when he went through that little garden. Do you know that, that garden that belonged to the cottage? Yeah. You know, the footpath goes right through the garden. Yeah. I just think that's so quirky, isn't it, and amazing. Yeah. And at first I said to you, gosh, wouldn't that be annoying for the person that lives there? But you quite rightly said, well, they will have bought the house knowing that there was a footpath, you know, a right of way through the garden. But then in another way, I just think it's so cute that you just yeah. walk through yeah. and there was like vegetables growing and flowers and things. Yeah, yeah. And then just as you walk through it, you filmed that little tiny babbling little stream. That's right, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was listening to that and I just thought, oh, I could just sit there for like an hour and just sit and just be listening to that little stream. Just thought that was lovely. The great thing about the Dales is no matter how, because down by the river, specifically at that crossing, there was a few people around. Yeah. And actually, after you've been sort of up exploring up high on the moor, when you get down there and you see a few people, it feels quite nice mm -hmm. because you've not seen anybody. But then you know, anyone will know this who's walked in the Dales, as fast as you see people, you're then away from them again, and it's unbelievably mm -hmm. tranquil. Mm -hmm. As soon as I left the side of the river, I didn't see a soul. Mm. That was it. There was one point. I'm walking up, a re I'm on my way up the deer park. It was steep, that wasn't really it? Really steep. <laughs> and, you know, I'm really sort of slogging my way up this farm track, and I hear this vehicle... And I'm thinking, oh, you know, it's going to be some farm vehicle, probably the farmer, and it's like coming really slowly. Comes around the corner, it's a supermarket delivery van. <laughs> Can you believe that? I, I've never, I mean, I'd walked through quite a few gates that I'd had to open and close. Mm. I mean, that's commitment from, from the supermarket. I know. I mean, good for them for being up there, but I pity the yeah. poor driver trying to negotiate those roads. What a walk, though. What a walk. Definitely... Without any shadow of a doubt, my favourite one yet. I think it was wonderful. I just the scene, you know, the scenery, and I think it just makes you realise how lucky we are to live. Yeah. You know, we're a very small island, but really. Absolutely but jam packed. So full lucky that of history that goes yeah, back. Yeah. Thousands and, and thousands of years. You know, these places are protected. You know, and they won't ever be built on. And I think that is just fantastic. And, you know, lovely, it makes you appreciate that dale all the more, discovering mm. the story of how it became populated. Just a wonderful experience. But now, though, it's time for us to get excited about the next My Favourite Colourways. And oh. it's the summeriest My Favourite Colourways in the history mm. of summer. I need to practice it because my notes were quite rough. <laughs> so I'm really hoping I can recreate the colour. That's to come next time. Oh yes, it's going to be wonderful. Yes. Now it's time for the Andy Bits. Andy Bits. Now then, you have a lovely extra prize to show for the Jelly Roll Cow. I which do. is of course ongoing at the moment. It yep. launched last episode when Kay, start, when Kay launched the pattern. Yep. And it's going to be lovely and lots of lovely prizes. Yes, so this is my Jelly Roll blanket knit along. Um, so this is, of course, the Jelly Roll pattern which yes. Kay launched last time. Yep. This is the Jelly Roll blanket This itself. is the Jelly Roll blanket. Yes. So we've got the Knit Along ongoing at the moment, and that runs until the end of August, so you've got loads of Jelly Roll knitting time. You don't have to finish it. All of the rules, I'll say in inverted commas, because there really aren't any rules at all, 
but they're all in the Ravelry thread on our group if you want to go and have a look. But that runs until the end of August, you don't have to finish your blanket, just keep posting pictures in that thread and I'll draw all the winners from that thread. But I was sent another lovely prize, we've got so far I've got the six skeins of my hand dyed yarns, the ones that I've been dyeing during the My Favourite Colourways. We've got a sock tube snake thing from Ducky Darlings that was a gift and I was sent another gift recently and this is amazing. I purchased a bag from Emma recently at Eldenwood Crafts because well, I just love her bags and she put up all these bags of like sort of allotment themed and I saw this fabric and I thought oh that's fantastic so I ordered it and when I ordered it she'd sent two she put in an extra one exactly the same as mine a surprise so this is the bag that's going into the prize drawer from lovely emma gorgeous don't you love oh i want to want to, i want to be in that garden with the greenhouse and a wheelbarrow and oh my goodness one day so emma thank you so much so this will be another fantastic prize for our jelly roll knit along cool but not only, of course, do we have the Jelly Roll Knit Along ongoing, we also have our year-long Amazonian yep. Warrior Challenge, which is for our runners and walkers and also for our patron knitters and crocheters. Yep. Oh yes, and all the details of that are in our show notes below. The radio show yes. will be back yes. next week. Yes. And thank you all so much for your messages. We know we've not put out a show in six weeks. The reason for that have been many, and we'll get into that when we yeah. broadcast our next radio show. But yeah. we have a plan to try and get ahead of the game. Because the radio show is reliant on good weather, it, it, really what we need to try and do is have a few in in the bag yeah, yeah. because if we get hit by bad weather and then if other factors come in as well which we'll touch on in the radio show then it really can scupper things but that's the reason primarily why there's not mm -hmm. been a show for a little while because every time we've come to record it's just not Something been right us. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes the radio show will be back next week and yes. we will be talking about parenthood Right, yes. interesting so it's, it's, topic. Well, it's another, we've done a parenthood one before mm. on how, you know, on the birth. Yes. <laughs> And Becoming now, a new parent, if you yes. like. Yeah. And, and now this one is, you know, we're starting to feel older and yeah. children are starting to grow. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's, you know, those, those older parenthood challenges. That's coming next week. But folks, that's it. That's it. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for watching. It's Thanks been everyone. wonderful to see you. When we see you in two weeks, Kay will, of course, have a lovely My Favourite Colourways. Yep. And, yeah, so have a lovely time over the next couple of weeks. Have a great time. Hope and it's we'll, not too hot. Yes. <laughs> and we'll see you soon. <laughs> see you soon. Bye. in a castle watching the bakery bears It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bakery